Hello, and welcome back to General Chemistry 2. My name is Daniel, and in this video, we're going to be talking about chemical equilibrium. So first off, let's just define exactly what I mean when we say equilibrium. So in most of the reactions we talked about in General Chemistry 1, we assumed that the reaction went 100% to completion, meaning that all of the possible reactants were converted into products. What happens in many reactions, however, is that a reaction will only go part of the way. So that's what I mean by equilibrium. Let's look at the transition of NO2 gas to N2O4 as an example. So NO2 gas, as you see on the left, is this brown gas, whereas N2O4 is colorless. When we, have N2O, when we have NO2 and we put it in the conditions of a reaction, what we see happen is it'll slowly start to become less and less colored. But it's, the solution won't become fully colorless. What will instead happen is what you see in the middle circle there. We'll have some kind of end mixture of NO2, which is brown, and N2O4, the colorless glass, to give us some kind of a light brown looking color. So that's what we mean by equilibrium. Equilibrium is describing that point that occurs somewhere in between a full amount of reactants and a full amount of products. So one thing I should clarify about equilibrium is that equilibrium isn't a static condition, meaning that in the previous example, the NO2 isn't converted to N2O4 and then everything just stops. What equilibrium is is known as a dynamic process. So that means, if you look at this graph, as we approach equilibrium, let's say we have an excess of reactants and we're forming products, as the reaction goes on, the rate of formation of products is going to slow down, and then what that's known as the forward rate, and the reverse rate as more products are created is going to start speeding up until eventually they reach this point you see over here. So when the forward rate of reaction, let's say we had something like this, when the forward rate of reaction equals the reverse rate of reaction, you can think about it as the formation of products is going at the same speed as uh, the formation of reactants. So the concentrations of both are staying constant, but they're constantly being interconverted between A and B, the uh, reactants and the products. So what's going to be useful for us is we're going to need to be able to quantify exactly where an equilibrium position is. And we do that through something known as the equilibrium constant. Let's say we have this reaction A plus B equals to C plus D with their lowercase coefficients. We can define the equilibrium constant as the products to their coefficients powers over the reactants to their coefficient powers. powers. So that would be C to the C power, D to the D power, divided by A to the A power, and B to the B power. So what you'll notice then is that a larger K is going to mean a dominance of products. That would mean C and D are larger. If K is small, that's going to mean there's going to be a dominance on the reactants, or the reverse reaction will be more favorable. The equilibrium constant can either be given to you in a problem, or sometimes you'll have to find it. And that can be calculated based on um, concentrations that are found at equilibrium. So let's say you have a reaction going on, and you wait until the concentrations stop changing and measure them. If you measure them and put them into this equation, you'll be able to solve for the equilibrium constant. The equilibrium constant is something we're going to be utilizing a lot in the next, in this chapter and the next few chapters, especially with things like acids and bases that you'll see in the uh, next few videos. So some other things about the equilibrium constant. We can also get the equilibrium constant from pressures in the same way that we can talk about react and we could talk about it with concentrations. We could theoretically interconvert between them with the ideal gas law, PV equals nRT from last semester. So the equilibrium pressure expression from pressure is pretty much the same thing, except now we're just using partial pressures instead of concentrations. The one important thing to note is that we can interconvert between what's known as Kp for pressure and Kc for concentration using this equation over here. So what you'll notice is that Kp equals Kc times Rt to this power delta n. What is delta n? 
delta N is the change in moles of gaseous products as the reaction goes by. So let's say, for example, I had a gas reaction like this. I have A forms uh, 2B. So then the change in moles of gas would be just the coefficient of B minus the coefficient of A. So that would equal what is just 1 in this case. And you can do that for any kind of reaction if you needed to convert between Kp and Kc. In the workshop, we'll get into some of the nuances of doing that precisely. If the moles of gas don't change, if delta N equals 0, that would mean that the expression RT becomes equal to 1, and Kp would equal Kc. So as that says in the uh, final line down there. Okay, one other thing is that when we're talking about equilibrium, we're generally going to be only talking about things that are gaseous or in the aqueous phase. What, what's been seen from experiments and through some uh, interesting calculations is that generally solids and liquids aren't going to um, contribute to equilibrium when there are mixed phases. For example, in the... Uh, in the decomposition of calcium carbonate to calcium oxide and CO2, what we see is that the equilibrium expression is only going to depend on CO2, the gaseous component. It's not dependent on CaCO3 and or uh, calcium oxide because they're both solids. So if you ever see a solid or a liquid in an expression with gases and aqueous parts, that's not going to be in your... Um, equilibrium expression. So just keep that in mind in the future and when you're doing workshop problems. Okay, so one thing that's important to talk about is let's say we're given a bunch of concentrations, uh, some starting concentrations. What we need to know is we need to know whether given these concentrations are we going to have a shift towards the products that's also known as shifting to the right or are we going to have a shift towards going to the reactants, known as a shift to the left? And what we can do is we can calculate this thing called reaction quotient. It has the same um, equation as K, but we're using Q when the concentrations are at equilibrium. So for example, let's say we have our Haber process here of N2 plus 3H2 forms ammonia. And we have these different concentrations, and we want to see, first off, if this is at equilibrium, and if it's not, what is the, um, which direction is the equilibrium going to shift? Is it going to form more products, or is it going to form more reactants to reach equilibrium? So there's three different scenarios that can happen. We can have Q equals K. That means the system's at equilibrium. We can also have Q greater than K. So what that would mean is that the ratio of products to reactants is too large. And so we'd have to shift to the left and form more reactants for products. On the other hand, if Q is less than K, we have a ratio of products to reactants that's too small. And so we'd need to convert from reactants to products in the forward direction. These three scenarios are going to be very important for you to remember. So definitely keep them in mind. And you could see them even from the mathematics of the, uh, the Q equation here. So let's solve that out for these given sets of concentrations. So we have these given concentrations, and let's calculate Q. Remember that it's in the same way that's seen for the um, expression for K. So we have the product NH3 on top. It's squared because of its coefficient. And then N2 and H2 cubed are on the bottom because of the fact that they are reactants and uh, of their coefficients. So if we plug in everything here, we'll get 1 times 10 to the negative 3 squared over 1 times 10 to the negative 4 times 2 times 10 to the negative 3. And that will come out to be 1.25 times 10 to the 6th. So now we can compare. We have 1.25 times 10 to the 6th.